Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our Priyajana series, which is practical knowledge uh, sharing on COVID. And um, mostly, this is uh, uh, most of the slides you're going to see are um, created and uh, put together by Dr. Cheryl Ortel, who is a um, medical doctor, OB, which semi-retired OBGYN and a geneticist. Um, she has, you know, she has um, extensively researched into COVID and um, have developed a slew of insights that's hybrid with her genetic knowledge and medical knowledge. And she's uh, sharing with us, this is the third part of the series that we had as a three-part session of the 14. And then with us, um, Dr. Joyce Grossman, who is also um, Chief of Population Health and uh, Research at Globex Health. She is a board certified infectious disease, pediatrics and internal medicine doctor, who also has a master's in genetics, a separate master's in sub biology and, and a background in immunology and biochemistry. Um, she has extensive background in population health management. So some of the things that's going on with COVID is an interesting viewpoint that comes from her. And then we have Dr. Adesova Okasanya, who's a family medicine physician practicing. She will be moderating this session. Um, Dr. Okasanya has extensive experience in virtual health, population health, and also she's been on the COVID front line. And brought to you by Globex Health. Good evening, this is Dr. Ortel. Um, I'm here on the third and final um, session that I'm going to present to you looking at some of the genetics of COVID-19 and how uh, they might be uh, of interest to everyone out there. Just a reminder that there are other COVID-19 resources, the CDC, um, who and who has a really nice uh, video for uh, lay people on how to put a mask on properly and take it off. Um, clinical trials are available um, and the national governors. So I'm going to talk to you tonight again about some medical and genetic perceptives, perspectives um, with COVID-19 and some of the paradoxes. So tonight we're going to cover uh, some updates in the numbers. We're going to go over the super antigen sequence that's in SARS-CoV-2. We're going to look at some rubella homologs that are there, and uh, we'll look at some vaccines and see what they're doing to either help or uh, hinder a, a COVID infection. We'll also talk a little bit about seroconversion and convalescent plasma. So globally, we're up to 14 million. In the United States, We've almost got 4 million cases. Death toll is pretty much um, almost flattened for the United States. If you want to go to nextstrain.org, you can see all of the different strains um, around the world. They've got uh, the, con the countries, not the strains, are uh, colored over here at different colors. And you can also. Um, when you go to next strain, you can also make it so that you can see each strain. Um, we can talk about strains in more detail. I talked about the G-clade, and right now the G-clade is the European strain, and that one is now making up 70% of, of the positive COVID cases that have been sequenced. And it turns out that only 0.06% um, of COVID-19 cases have been sequenced. Oh, so that brings an interesting point. I mean, Dr. Grossman, do you want to kind of um, kind of pitch into that? Maybe does it does this kind of give us a sense that now that the G clad, which is kind of like the mutated strain of this, but right, it, the G, the G yeah, clad, well, the G clad now is the predominant strain. Right. When this infection first started. It was a different strain, and that was the right. one in China, which did not have quite as much inflammatory manifestations. So, again, coronaviruses mutate. They mutate very quickly, 
And um, I, now this is the predominant strain. We may get another mutation, and we don't know what that will bring. But at this point, the Italian strain is, is, seems to be very inflammatory. There is one base pair change. It stabilized the uh, spike protein and made it bend rather than uh, be so stiff. And that meant when something tried to knock it off, it would just bounce back. Now, now that the G clade um, strain is so predominant, what you're going to be seeing is that it's going to keep new, new mutations keep getting added to it. So we'll eventually see this little G, it will, may have another letter next to it. So as the mutations start racking up. And uh, in, the, in the last talk, we talked about, for example, um, a new mutation that was being seen in the G clade in Sweden, Wales, and England. Mm. And I, 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 um, they started talking about the, the S and the L mutations, but those, are, those were so early, those are so far gone, G's taken over everything. So um, it's not really cogent anymore. Last time we talked a little bit about epistasis, and epistasis is how um, well genes uh, can affect each other. So uh, there's something called a polybasic cleavage site that's very important. It's called PPRA, and we're going to talk a lot about PPRA um, today. So the ACE receptor, um, ACE2 receptors over here, there's a receptor binding domain, and then um, right in the middle of the S1, S2 um, protein, there's a PPRA, which is a, is a cleavage site. So being next to something is really important. So here we have a site, we're gonna start talking about the super antigenic character of this, this sequence. And it's right near PPRA. So I, I make a big deal out of it right now because we're gonna keep talking about PPRA and the super antigenic character. So what is it? Well, there are such things called super antigens and they're written like this and it happens to be near the PPRA. So here is SARS-CoV-2 and notice none of the other SARS, so SARS classic, there's a couple other bat viruses and even the, um, the um, bat virus from 2013 do not have this PRRA sequence in it. All right. Um, so the, one of the things we're going to look at today is this QTNS PPRA. And we're going to see what's similar to this sequence because it makes a difference in making it a super antigen. So again, Nothing else really has that thing because the PPRA is missing in all these other viruses, including SARS. One of the things they thought the super antigen sequence might be responsible for the toxic shock syndrome cytokine storm that we're seeing in some people. So there's symptoms a lot like toxic shock and so these super antigen structures are seen with other viruses and bacteria, um, and they can bind directly to T cell receptors, causing a huge immunological um, response. All right, so here we've got that sequence I was talking to you about right here on top. So isn't this interesting? It has a lot of homology with uh, alpha cobra toxin. And then the next one, this is an Asian um, poisonous snake toxin. Here's rabies. Look how, how um, much red there is in, in um, common with SARS-CoV-2 and rabies. And then HIV was a very little, okay, for this one. And and here's our PRRA spot, okay? Now, what kind, what else in terms of super antigens 
is similar on the, the SARS-CoV-2. Well, there's something called the Staph aureus enterotoxin type B. So everybody calls it SEB for short. And that looks like this. And wherever there's red, that's really similar. So um, you don't have to say, well, everything's not perfect. The geneticists have told you if they, if they made it red, it's very, very similar. So there is nothing like this in SARS. But in SARS-CoV-2, we got a lot of sequence homology similar to this SEB, which can, um, the SEB had the ability to bind to major histocompatibility complexes. And these would present the antigen um, to other cells and they would uh, stimulate a large population of T cells. Now, if, when you talk about stimulating a large population, this is when you can have the inappropriate flood of your cytokines or the cytokine storm, where you just are making far too much of things that these cells make, like interleukin-2, interleukin-4, especially interleukin-6. And we had talked last time about the interleukin-6 being um, elevated in obese children who would have some of these problems. Tumor necrosis factor alpha, and interferon C. So um, SEB has been found to bind to, to another regulator of T cell immune response, the CD28. So we're trying to figure out why are people having, some people, why do they get this toxic shock type response? All right, so now there's even another fragment in um, SARS-CoV-2 that has some similarities, but the interesting thing is it can be read backwards. You can read it forward and backwards and it can still stimulate um, an antigenic response. So making a lot of these interleukin-6, interleukin-2, interleukin-4 in response to having it. So there's this broader stretch and this also has a super antigen type effect. You can read it in the reverse direction, same thing. So this tells us that in um, some cases, there is gonna be a high propensity for SARS-CoV-2 to have binding site residues that might act like a super antigenic fragment. And there's a lot of talk about um, what kind of fragments and what kind of sequences we see. You know, we can see all kinds of different sequences in, uh, in a virus that, and isn't it interesting in the beginning, um, some of the doctors out of uh, Asia were saying they thought that um, COVID's may have come out of snakes. <laughs> so they, they knew about the snake venom, they're seeing sequences that, um, that were similar to snake venom, they go, huh, maybe that's something, but, uh, isn't it interesting that this has happened? And uh, we just have to wait and see just how strong, and you know, there's so many things. Is it the person? Is it the virus mutation? Um, what is it that could cause this out of control um, reaction to this super antigenic fragment? Yeah, so well, you it's important. It, I, sorry, I wanted to interrupt, but it's important to remember that any response you have is a specific reaction between the host and the virus. And children in particular have a young immunological system. And therefore, it's, it's really more robust because children are meant to explore things like be on the floor, pick up things and stick it in their mouth. And maybe that's why children, when they get infected, have a super response to it. Whereas the older you are, I think the less likely you are to have a severe cytokine response. So how would you, how would you kind of, um, so how would, cause you know, we, we've had a different thing. I mean, of course we have this um, Kasaki-like syndrome that is occurring with children who tend to have, a, I guess, a serious response to it. But then, but we see, we see, we do see in the majority of children that do have this, there, there is less, um, there is less uh, response going on. They tend to be asymptomatic. How do we, how do we kind of correlate that? How does that kind of play out? Um, I think people are 
thinking there's something different about these children. Mm -hmm. uh, the English had a study where they were looking at 20 children that had been affected with um, this type of toxic shock like Kawasaki and uh, most of them had um, African Caribbean backgrounds. Uh, most were male. It's, it's interesting, we're, everybody's trying to figure out what makes these people different. And then we know that some uh, people are better at clearing these things than other than others. So toxins and fragments and your inflammatory response can be cleared better in other people. So the, the jury is still out on exactly why this is happening. When I was in practice at Kings County, one summer, we had uh, maybe three children who had classic Kawasaki's disease and they were the only ones who had it. They had the swollen feet, the red lips. It's, it's really incredible, the high temperatures. And I mean, we treated them, which was standard at the time with the gamma globulin and aspirin because the main problem with Kawasaki is the aneurysms of the cardiac uh, vessels. Right. And the aspirin pre pre prevents that. But we never knew what virus it was. It seems that that summer there was a virus that did in children a, a severe, the same, a similar type of syndrome that children are getting now with the COVID-19. Right, and after what we've just looked at, isn't it interesting that that virus may have had some kind of sequence that was super antigenic? Right. Yeah, at the time, no one was very interested. It was something that, if you remember when Kawasaki's uh, disease was first described in Japan, they didn't even know what caused it. They didn't even think it was an infectious response. There was this rumor that it was due to new carpeting because in Japan, some of the first children who got this syndrome had new carpeting placed in their homes. And so they were off investigating some toxin that was causing it. Yes, isn't and that it took interesting? A, a, a while to realize it was an infectious agent. That uh, because of the toxin, may perhaps they'd been uh, predisposed. It's possible. I mean, it was just in Japan, and it was a cluster of children who it appeared that. They got this syndrome, but they also had a history of having new carpeting place. And we know new carpeting releases a lot of toxins. Right. Hmm. So sort of an interesting, you know, story about Kawasaki's disease. Absolutely. I was reading this and I came across uh, a French paper that had been translated into English and uh, here they said, well, geez, um, you know, maybe if we used an antihistamine very, very early, we could modulate this antigen reaction that's happening. And so uh, what they, they said, well, um, it, antihistamines are cheap, they're safe, um, let's give it a try. So they took 26 people who came came through. Now, we, this was very early in the, um, the pandemic, so they did not use any testing because remember how the test kits were not available all over the world? So they went by clinical diagnosis. They got informed consent and they started treatment with a standard dose of antihistamine. The drug choice was left to that practitioner, but they only recommended that you use a second generation antihistamine. The patient was treated as soon as they were diagnosed. So you call the doctor, if he listened to you and he thought you had um, COVID, he said, go ahead and you're gonna start a second generation antihistamine. So 92% were giving sertrazine, 4% got Clarinex, 4% got levosertrazine, which is Zizol, and they all took their dose for 14 days regardless. Well, the interesting thing I thought was that within four to six hours, people felt better. And by 48 hours, people pretty much felt like they didn't have symptoms. They were kept on the antihistamine for 14 days and 
nobody was um, put in the hospital, nobody got severe. So that was interesting. So let, let's take a look at um, oral antihistamines. So the, the number one, the strongest one, is supposed to be cetirizine or Zyrtec. Very few people get drowsy with it. Uh, Zizol is similar, but not as effective. Um, and these are over the counter. And the, the third one was Claritin. It's also weaker than um, the others. They did not, um, nobody, they didn't use Allegra, and I'm not sure if that's a French thing, um, you know, whether it's available over there as, as well, over the counter. And of course, they didn't want to do H1. So if we look at um, the histamine receptors, just look at the H2 at all the, uh, it, all the different organ systems that H2 blocks. There was also very early on, there was a um, paper out of um, China that said that uh, people coming in who were on um, thimidine did much, much better. And, and so they were like, well, geez, how does that work? And they didn't give Benadryl or any of the sedating ones. Remember, they just did over-the-counter. So um, in New York, they did a small study where they took 10 consecutive patients, and they had them take high-dose famitidine. The doses were about 80 milligrams three times a day in six people, and they stayed on it for about 11 days. They all noticed improvement at doses ranging anywhere from 60 to 240 milligrams. And um, here we go, here, look at the symptoms. Start up here, by two days, you're down here, and by 14 days, woo, their symptoms, you know, were going a good deal down. Of course, not as good as for the French study using the H2 antihistamine. But remember, the famididine only blocks the gastric acid. Have you seen anything like that? It's an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, finding. I mean, I have yeah. I've never even heard anything about the antihistamines. I think I've heard something very brief, but not anything I put in practice, actually, with, on the front lines when I was. I mean, Dr. Grossman, what was your thought? No, no, I, I really haven't heard anything about it. So that's why it's very, very interesting. Mm. It doesn't... Just, yeah, there was a dentist who said they always put, um, in one of the groups I'm in, he said, oh, well, we always put people who have a virus on Zizol and something else. I can't remember what it was. And they do great. You got to put them on a, an antihistamine right away. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, the dentist tells us. <laughs> Fair. I mean that is that is really interesting. I mean I I I really wonder I because I mean looking at I'm thinking back at all the protocols that during the, of course during the acute time when New York and New Jersey was kind of uh, overwhelmed. I'm thinking about all the protocols we got from different um, universities. None of them really kind of pointed to a H2 blocker. So no, none of them. None the, of them. the patients were no. never put on H2 blockers. So no. that's why it's very very interesting. I think the Eastern Virginia Medical School critical care protocol says fametidine is an is an optional option. Interesting. In in their protocols. Mm. Oh. All right. Well, now we're now we're going to um, look to see: Do prior vaccinations make any difference to COVID nineteen infections? So remember, we're talking about paradoxes. And so um, th this is just some crazy information. Mm -hmm. Measles, mumps, and rubella potentially reduces poor outcome, but will not prevent a COVID-19 infection. All right, so you have to have the infection and something happens and you have a less worse outcome because you um, have had measles, mumps, or rubella. So they said there's something about the rubella patients. Um, when they got SARS-CoV-2, their rubella IgG levels went up really 
um, high. And so did, were they having an, another outbreak of rubella? Because, you know, sometimes you get one virus infection and it stimulates a latent uh, virus. Yeah, exactly. Or is it, is there something about um, SARS-CoV-2 that stimulates your rubella T cells to make more antibodies? So uh, they had a hypothesis that they were going to try human immunoglobulin because that contains all kinds of antibodies. So they, they're throwing the kitchen sink at this with the um, immunoglobulin. And they said they took ones from people that could have had all three viruses or they could have had the um, vaccinations and see if they could rescue severe COVID infection. So let's take a look. Um, Aunt Rubella and SARS-CoV-2. Sorry. So here we have SARS-CoV-2. And remember, whenever the geneticists put these little red box, pay attention because that's areas of homology. And you know, when it's red, things are more alike. And so there's areas, so here's your rubella virus. And so then they're, they're showing us that there's some areas that really are the same. They have sequences, so not the entire genome, but sequences related to rubella. So isn't that interesting? So those are the ones you want to take a look at. So there, so there is some homology between SARS-CoV-2 and rubella. So here we have SARS-CoV-2. And basically what I want you to see from here is just kind of how this SARS-CoV-2 kind of looks like rubella, OK? The pictures are sort of similar. So the MMR vaccine provides some kind of protection against COVID-19. Maybe so, they share antigenic sites. In exactly. other words, it may be a part of the virus that's very, of rubella, it's very antigenic. And so you get some memory that gets stimulated and helps you fight the COVID virus. You're going to have people, um, right, so you're going to have some people where this crossover with the vaccine is going to be helpful. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And especially when you remember that immune response genes, you know, cause certain populations to respond to antigens, which other populations don't. So it's very heterogeneous, so it makes a lot of sense. Right, um, and we've also had people look at BCG vaccinations. So this was, um, I had asked an infectious disease specialist from China if he had noticed anything related to vaccines and COVID, and he you know, was like, no, no, <laughs> I didn't notice anything. And I thought that was interesting because apparently China is having a big problem with TB. So anyways, this study though came from South Africa, and they have seen with BCG vaccination um, that they they saw that it reduced viremia after you're, you were exposed, and therefore people had less severe COVID-19 symptoms and a more rapid recovery if they'd had the BCG vaccine. But I want to mention that there was another paper out of Israel. They looked at a very narrow population of the they looked between 30s and um, like 41 or 42, and it had absolutely no benefit. But it would have been interesting to see if it uh, had any benefit in the older pop in the older population. Well, that, they didn't. Uh, well, that is pretty interesting. I mean, that is something I've heard with the BC um, G vaccine having some, at least some, efforts towards the virus uh, or at least COVID-19. I mean, um, Dr. Grossman, anything you? Yeah. Well, actually. When I was doing, when I was in internal me in medicine at uh, Kings County, much of the population that we were seeing had BCG immunizations. But remember, they immunize the, them in childhood. They don't get immunized as adults. So for a lot of the population, it wanes, but it's variable. There are some people who maintain, you know, their positive PPDs after 
uh, receiving BCG, but many people lose it. And that may be a reason why it's the results are so conflicting. Yeah. I, Good have point. Your, I have here Dan Stein making a comment here. He says a recent analysis of T cell responses seems to indicate the early transcription proteins are common to all beta coronaviruses and are sequenced identically, possibly explaining the pre-existing immunity from memory T cells. That could probably, do you think that's um, the thing? Right, and some of the, some of the things uh, that they're finding, uh, we're not, we weren't really going to talk about it today, is that the um, NSP seven and 13 proteins um, seem to be antigenic across viruses. And so this may be related to why people are uh, more, there's more herd immunity than we thought because of these two particular proteins. So th those are, that's interesting in itself. But that's a, a whole nother topic. Right. Um, so the final take home lessons about TB and COVID-19 are you really have to do some really um, exceptional infection control because if you have TB and you get COVID or if you, been, um, you have latent TB, getting COVID or another influenza type infection can cause that to pop out instead of being latent, it's going to become active. Yeah, it reactivates. And that's interesting about TB because illness does that. Even old age does that. I mean, you'll have immigrants who come to this country and have been fine and they get old and they get sick with, let's say, prostatic uh, cancer and their TB becomes active. Mm. So, I mean, there, there is a re relationship between all this. So, and, it, and if they've had the flu or influenza, that can, that can decrease their T cell immunity and weaken their immune responses against secondary bacterial infections. And that's one of the reasons you hear people who are treating um, COVID-19 are treating right away with antimicrobials that also have antiviral effects because the, the high rate of secondary bacterial infections. It's so you want to kill two birds with one stone. It's Juby. I'm going to jump in and ask a question because there's a lot of third, you know, immigrants from different countries who have exposed to TB or have exposed in this country. They are PPD positive but may not be active would do you have some suggestions for people like that at in this point they should consider themselves at high risk and uh, do social distancing you know and really um really stay away from other people yes because they could reactivate i mean that is the that is tuberculosis when you're young and healthy it stays suppressed when you get sick or when you get older. It rears its ugly head and you get active disease and you're contagious. So I probably got my rubellas a little bit out of order here, but in um, England, they looked at a couple of groups that uh, had COVID-19 um, to moderate severity to severe, so that severe cases would be in the ICU. And if you were um, really severe, you had an average increase in rubella IgG going up to 161, plus minus, you know, 147. And your IgM um, really wasn't affected that much. So they looked at this also in Spain, Italy, and Germany. And um, if you had severe disease, look at how high you'd spike your rubella IgG titers. Moderate disease didn't get a big response as much as the severe. And uh, the Italians were interested in this because in September of 2019, the Italians had a huge push to get everybody um, 
vaccinated for the flu and they were very happy to have a new flu vaccine that had four types of um, viruses. So they had H1N1, H3, N2, and two um, different types of B, um, B uh, influenza viruses. The other thing that was unusual about their influenza vaccine was that it was cultured from animal cells so that it had more of a boost to the immune system. Most everybody else has influenza vaccines that are produced in embryonated chicken eggs. Right. So they had, in that area that was uh, hit the worst, they had 141,000 doses of vaccine were given for the winter flu, and 129,000 were over the age of 65. 70% of those had heart problems. In the, and at the very same time, it just started a little later, they had a huge hepatitis C vaccination program going on. And so everybody was also getting vaccinated against hepatitis C. Um, and I had seen a paper and I, I looked it up from the Department of Defense. And in the 2017 to 2018 flu vaccine uh, season, they looked at um, whether or not having a flu vaccine made you more likely to get the flu or something else. And pretty much, um, if you got the flu vaccine during that time, you were, le you were less likely to get influenza. Influenza A, there's, I didn't have enough room to put the whole table in, but pretty much all those respiratory viruses, you were a lot less likely to get, except for our coronavirus. So if you got the flu vaccine, you were much more likely to have um, a subsequent coronavirus infection. And remember, this is before SARS-CoV-2. So I thought that, that was interesting. Um, so there's, I, I don't know, China didn't have any data on their flu vaccine and their flu vaccine could, you know, could be from China. And so it's very different than what we do with the adjuvants in that. And I have not yet seen anything coming out of Italy for the final tally on whether or not having a flu vaccine and the hepatitis, because hepatitis C is also associated with causing some other problems. Um, so I, I have not seen a final paper on that only that the doctors were discussing it. So um, they're in the past, now we're talking about SARS. So this is from 2003, that SARS infection. They were trying to make a vaccine to SARS. So there was a nice little study where they took, made four different vaccines. They used them with an alum and adjuvant, without, um, VLP is virus-like particles, and they, um, they gave them to mice, they gave them to ferrets, I think they gave them to pigs, um, and other studies, not just the one I had here, okay? So, the, so they, these animals were making antibodies, okay? So, they're great. This is what, this will be what you'll hear in the news. Oh, this uh, vaccine for SARS-CoV-2 the people made antibodies, so that's a good thing. However, when they gave these uh, mice SARS-CoV again, they got a hypersensitivity reaction. They had severe um, hepatitis. They had a severe inflammation of the lungs. Some of the mice died. So um, there has never been a successful vaccine for SARS. And some of the concerns then you can see for making a vaccine to uh, different components, and, and most people are were trying to do the vaccine to the spike protein. So we've already noticed that the spike protein has mutated to become a little bit stronger, but we've seen that there is a super antigenic sequence. And will some people get, get um, an antibody to that sequence? And if they see it again, will they have a a severe hypersensitivity reaction. And the uh, 
I think they're not, they're not requiring safety studies. So the person who gets the vaccine is, you know, the ones we're going to try to see if they're safe or not. And Moderna, um, the patients who got that dose of Moderna were showing up with a lot of serious side effects. So reminds me of the hypersensitivity that we saw. I mean, it, it would really be important to know, you see, and we don't do direct challenge. If you challenge them with COVID-19, and let's say they produce antibodies, you say, that's great. And then you re-challenge them. I mean, and if you saw horrible hypersensitivity reactions leading to hepatitis and lung inflammation, well, th then you got your answer. I mean, the way yeah, they're doing it, it's very hard to tell. And, um, and it's so interesting about the French study with giving the antihistamine. So would, would you want to give anybody, everybody who is getting the a vaccine and antihistamine? Don't know. Again, would if you gave an antihistamine concurrent with the vaccination, would you be then, let's say, muting the immune response to the vaccination? Because remember, exactly. these vaccines usually don't give you a very robust immunological response. So all, all very interesting. Yeah, no, it is. It's extremely interesting. And that's why it's so difficult. You right, know, we don't have the answers. That's the thing. So we just, but one of the things about these program, this program is to try to get you thinking. Um, you know, when we start hearing about how all these different vaccines are working, um, and thinking of questions to be asking about these vaccines. I mean, right. especially now that we're hearing about possibly getting recurrence of this virus after you've already had the disease. Right. Right. And then we're going to go into talk. We're going to, right now, that's a good segue. Um, how long does seroconversion last in COVID-19? Well, there was um, a very small study of nine patients, and they found that if you were, the sicker you were, the higher your antibody levels. All right. So mm -hmm. mild symptoms means that you didn't make much antibody, and so they're gone quicker. And we, the other thing we know is the viral burden typically peaks early in the illness. So it can take, the antibodies rise over the first two to three weeks. Um, you can culture the virus from the nasal pharyngeal specimens and it declines, declines really quickly after the first week of mild illness. Um, there's persistent detection of viral um, RNA many days to weeks after recovery, but is that inactivated or is that not? Now, South Korea says when they're having these positive people after they've um, been ill, they're saying it's an activated virus and they're letting them go back to work. Uh, in London, they looked at 65 people and they followed them for 94 days to see how much they had. So they, um, they noticed that about 95% did seroconversion and they were, um, they were able to identify neutralizing antibodies after about eight days after the onset of symptoms. So most people have symptoms within the first five days. Disease severity peaked, there's a observation period and then a, a rapid decline. And here you can see on this graph, the zoom, um, how on average the antibody titers decrease. We were noticing also that in families uh, where people may have had a lower load, they were not having such um, seroconversion as the people who were sick in the hospital. So they're, they're getting over the virus by other mechanisms without making that much antibody. Ah. We've got a few minutes left, so I just wanted to make sure we talked about um, convalescent plasma. If you have someone in the hospital and you think they are going to need convalescent plasma, that's people from who've had the infection with SARS-CoV-2 and they have antibodies. 
these uh, antibodies could help fight um, the virus. So you need to con contact and um, do all the paperwork. So you have to get a FDA fast track IRB approval for each and every patient has to get this. You can't get them for a bunch, it's done one at a time. But usually it takes about six to eight hours, um, I've been told, to get that. The plasma, you know, is blood separated out and you're left with all kind of components, including antibodies and they, um, they're given um, type specific and they're looking at this across Europe and in the United States in 57 institutions. So usually if you, if you need it, you can get it. Right, and, and it's interesting because this is of course something that um, we've had in, I guess in our toolbox as, as doctors for a while. It's not something new. This is something we've done for other um, diseases as well. I think um, also one has to really realize and know because I think a lot of people hear about this and they say, okay, great. And it's kind of fair to kind of really let people know that, hey, there is a lot of hurdles to get that. Um, I mean, not, not, it's not impossible, but it's not like, oh, just ordering a drug, you know? It's not like, hey, boom, you're, not, you're gonna get it. No, absolutely, you have to, there's a whole process, IRB approval, then you have to kind of find someone who's matching, then you have to kind of work it up and separate and do all those things, and that's for one person. So, um, and it's usually kind of done in the ICU, of course, so it's really under um, strict critical uh, care pr um, protocol. So again, you know, but definitely is a um, good resource. It, well, it's, it, it appears to have some efficacy. It right. ha definitely has been shown to show no harm. Problem right. also is, is that there's a finite, risk, you know, availability of it. People have to go and they have to donate their uh, plasma. And again, you know, it's easier said than done because it's difficult to get people to donate blood under most circumstances. So you know, you may say it's the best thing, and if it starts to be used very widely, there'll be shortages of it. So it's not a perfect solution, but there are companies that are working on monoclonal antibodies. And in fact, there's an, an ingenious company that has made a knockout cow, and their work with that produces human antibodies, and they're doing studies with that cow. So there are many things that are going on. And the only thing I could say is when you have a very sick patient, but the patient can't be dying. You know, if he, if he has one step, if he's one step away, away from dying, this plasma does not appear to help. But if he's very sick, this may be able to get him to survive. Exactly. And we can see that um, using convalescent plasma in 5,000 patients, we still had people having severe allergic transfusion reactions, um, acute lung injury, and circulatory overload. And oh, that, yeah. Well, again, if you, look, if, you, if you have one foot on a banana peel, then it's worth the, you know, anything, you know, to, to try to get you to survive. I mean, they are giving it to sick patients. Right. So exactly, this slide just summarizes what Joyce just said, that there's a lot of observational studies. Um, it's not perfect, there are side effects from it. Um, it can't save you if you're really severe. There are some pro-inflammatory things that can happen. You can get uh, thrombi and sepsis. Uh, the plasma therapy, if given late, is ineffective. So once the cytokine storm has done the damage, neutralizing antibodies aren't gonna reverse it you've infarcted those tissues, um, convalescent plasma is not going to help you recover. Exactly. The other thing they can do is cytosorb, which is like in dialysis, they have these really cool beads that kind of will take out um, the antibodies and ECMO. There's, there's not a lot left for these people who get really critical, although we're doing much better than we did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions for the panel? Uh, feel free to raise your hand or I can unmute you um, if you have any questions. 
Yeah, Juby, I can't see the hands. I, I'll be able to mark that if I can see it. Well, I had, we had a, a fun ride. We looked at we looked at the super antigens. Um, mm -hmm. We looked at all the different vaccines. Some help, some don't. It's um, it's a mixed bag. You really have to look at each person individually. But we did notice that COVID would um, make latent TB pop. And if you get an influenza, perhaps you'll be more disposed to getting a coronavirus. So that, those are interesting. I haven't seen any studies. Maybe we'll have some studies this fall to see whether or not the flu shot is helping or hurting. Well, let's hope it's her helping. Cause... Yeah, yeah, we're hoping it's helping. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's our hope. That's that our... When, you, when you prevent the flu, then, you know, you're getting patients better able to respond. Uh, it, it was to a great graph. If you get the flu shot, um, like there was this huge category where people didn't get anything. They had no pathogen um, detected. It was great. Huh. All except for that, that coronavirus. Um, <laughs> and by the way, if you do want to remove antibody, there is a column. It's a Cephadex column. And it has staph pro it has staph protein A on it, and staph protein A actually binds immunoglobulins. Problem with the column is is that it causes thrombosis, and that's why it never went into wide use. So the the cytosorb gets around that by having the beads, and when you're when you go through dialysis, the blood is going through some kind of beaded thing. Yeah, probably that may be the difference. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, I mean, I, did, I was involved in that work in the 70s, and that was the major problem with these columns. They did a great job of removing the immunoglobulin, but you got terrible thrombosis. So it, they never commercially became viable. So, yeah, the beads are very important in terms of what causes your, you know, your blood to clot. You know, probably if you have any little imperfection, that's it, <laughs> the clotting mechanism gets set off. Um, Mike, did you have any questions uh, for the doctors? Oh, not really particularly. I, 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 uh, I have uh, seen Dr. Ortel's uh, presentation on an ongoing basis and it's excellent. And I highly uh, recommend uh, uh, in uh, listening to us, <laughs> I find it to be excellent. No, I actually tuned in to see that, and uh, I, I was uh, very uh, interested in the new things uh, with the uh, cross antigenicity, antigenicity and uh, the uh, super antigen uh, idea. Uh, and I like, uh, I find it very interesting uh, when you're speaking of protein uh, particles or, or uh, shards being left at receptors after the ligand is left the receptor. I find that very interesting. Mm -hmm. it, by the way, is that a common property for viruses to do? I've not heard of this before. That uh, that I'm not. I'm no viral expert. That's for sure. Yeah, neither am I. I can't comment. No, I really don't know. If anybody out there knows, please. Yeah, it, would be, it would be interesting to know if, if, if microorganisms somehow were leaving behind um, pieces of something that could potentially obscure or affect, you know, uh, cause uh, binding problems with other substances, you, you know, uh, that would be interesting to know more about. I've, I've just not heard of it. It makes a lot of sense. I can see why it would happen. But, uh, yeah. It's but, yeah, I've, there's a whole field of study of exosomes. And after different kinds of insults and infections, uh, the body kicks out all this junk in an exosome. Right. And apparently that can turn your test positive. Yeah, I guess that would make sense. Uh, yeah, very odd. It's so, so strange how many things can happen. <laughs> well, I do know that in chicken pox, when members of the same family get the disease, usually the youngest child gets it the worst. And that's because the chicken pox actually picks up some, you know, DNA 
And so it gets better at infecting the host. So by the time the youngest child gets it, it's more adept and it causes the child to get sicker. Wow, yeah. So, of course, families share genetic material, and the virus actually, you know, is able to, uh, you know, use that. Yeah. You know how quickly these mutations start? Because in China, you know, basically people went out of the country and came back, and they had a mutated, a more aggressive uh, form. Yes, definitely, definitely. Hmm. Well, that's the only thing I could say that's good about the plasma is that as the virus changes, so will the body's immunological response to it. So therefore, the antibodies you make should at least match the new strain of virus. Yes, interesting. Yeah, yeah no, it is. And I mean, to me, that's at least one of the other uses of it is really to monitor the virus. So this way, you, you get an idea of what's happening. They actually make vaccine by using that process, I believe, also, or, or at least it can be done that way, uh, you know, by using what you call convalescent plasma. To, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think convalescent plasma has a lot of important uses, and it will continue to be of importance. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, it's, it, it's a finite substance so that, it, you know, you, it's going to have to be used very, very, you know, carefully. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know if you're familiar how convalescent plasma is typically has the viruses inactivated that are present in it at times. But Oh, tell us, Mike. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. I, mean, I may expand remember, upon that for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, methylene blue in photodynamic therapy is used to uh, clear uh, 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 enveloped uh, RNA viruses from convalescent plasma without damage to the uh, uh, other proteins and substances that are present there. So uh, that's been well studied. And one of the proposals that we, uh, Dr. Halas and I have put forward is that we believe there should be some interest in using both oral and intravenous or systemic uh, methylene blue um, in the treatment of uh, with photo combined with photodynamic therapy or photobiomodulation, um, you know, to help with COVID patients uh, that are systemically infected. And then, furthermore, that you could use the same methodology that is used with the convalescent plasma uh, at home as a mouthwash uh, and inactivate virus in the mouth. Uh, uh, with uh, using methylene blue and red light uh, therapy, which is actually very easy and expensive to do at home. Um, so we've, we're working to try to, uh, you know, have that uh, um, process reviewed uh, by as many physicians as would like to review it and, and poke holes in it, see if we can figure it out. But it, it appears to us that all the evidence and literature that we can find points to the fact that this would work. So that brings up to the next week, next week's session. We hope Mike and Dr. Halasa will be able to kind of share some of those things, including Dr. Halasa's European experience or some of the insights from what is going on, especially in Germany. Um, I do have one other question. Wendy, I unmuted you. Do you mind asking the questions since I'm happy to do so. Uh, can you discuss reports of people getting reinfected with SARS-CoV-2? I mean, are they actually getting infected twice, or are they testing positive the second time due to other factors? We're not sure, but it looks like um, people may have been infected with the original Wuhan strain and then got infected again with the more aggressive um, European strain. So yeah, that's, that's one thing. You know, of, of course, course they're different. Yeah, but the yeah. exact strain, I'd say no. But since it mutates so easily, that to me that's a real distinct possibility. Is it also possible that for someone who recovered from the from this novel coronavirus, could the immunity have worn off enough for them to get reinfected? Yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Again, that's part of the problem about using the um, plasma for prophylaxis. How long do these antibodies last in terms of their effectiveness? 
And there's some studies that say as little as two to three months. Yeah. Do you anticipate that when people get reinfected that they could have a more aggressive infection? That's possible because if it's re strain related, the strain um, from the early strain directly from China that was in Washington to the G clade has gotten better adapted. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, it seems these viruses, when they mutate and they take hold, they're not less, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, dangerous. They're more dangerous. They're more virulent. I, I I don't know why, but it just seems to be that's how they seem to work. Yeah, we were hoping with it mutating so much that it would start, you know, d getting portions deleted and stuff like that. Um, we, but but again, of course, if you're getting deletions and you have a less aggressive strain, then you're not going to see that. A person at the hospital. So you're you're going to be seeing all the aggressive strains uh, multiplying and uh, the patient showing up at the hospital. You know, um, I had a question. You know, since well, that's true. Uh, and those are the, the strains studied the most. So since we have two geneticists and who are medical doctors, and this is the last session that we have with Dr. Ortel, I had a question, and this is just based on your personal opinion. There is no medical um, thing. Based on what you have seen so far of this COVID virus, do you think what percentage is it a created or some sort of... Um, um, I, you know, n not natural evolution uh, is this virus. So it's kind of like, I don't want to say the right words, but give it in a reverse uh, way order. Well, there, that, that, that would take me a whole session. To just to <laughs> I know that. that. I sat through that. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but um, there's a lot of, a lot of things that point that uh, it, it could have easily have been made and not leave anything behind using CRISPR technology. So um, there's uh, so the, the nerd, I think the nerd at Wibbly does a nice job of looking at stuff. There's somebody on um, the medium.com that will go over a lot of data that's not in papers. For this thing, I. Uh, tend to, and for physicians, I tend to just not go with newspaper articles, but stay with things that are preprints or actually have been published in the literature. And um, Thursday at Nitro, at the Nitro Medicine Group, I am going to be um, discussing some of those papers and some of those yeah. ideas. That's interesting. And, you know, there was a study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science that indicated that this virus appeared in the Americas and Australia before it appeared in China, which is proof for thought. I, I, I can't really, I didn't, I didn't read the original paper, but it was in one of my proceedings from the American um, Chemical Society. I did see a report, and it was a newspaper report from uh, Barcelona, Spain, and they went back and looked at sewage samples, and they found in, on March 12, 2019, they found SARS-CoV-2 in the sewage sample. March, not a mistake, March 2000. 19, March 12th, 2019. You can look that up online. Barcelona, Spain. Sewage treat, uh, sewage had uh, SARS-CoV-2. You know, they were looking at this at the sewage to see, um, looking at viral load in that to, and to see if the, in different communities, if the virus was there already. Because um, they had so few tests so they could test the whole community by checking the sewage. Right. Oh, yeah. That's the very good way to monitor this virus. We have, Where was that uh, at, Dr. Ortel? Uh, with you, Mike, on Thursday. Oh, no, but I mean, on what country? 
Barcelona, Spain. Oh, in Spain, yes. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, Dr. Stein, you wanted to make a comment because I see that you mentioned something on the chat. I have unmuted you. Feel free to comment. Oh, well, I just wanted to comment that, uh, as Dr. Ortel mentioned, the uh, fur and cleavage site, uh, those four amino acids in the middle of the spike protein is absolutely unique to uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, but it's essentially impossible to have four amino acids go into a virus in exactly the right spot. Um, and, uh, and of course, that it increases its uh, infectivity uh, for the ACE2 receptor. Um, and evolutionarily, my understanding is that that's uh, statistically impossible. Um, well, Dr. Stein, um, if, if you go to the medical median and look it up, there's a guy who went over this and I double checked his work. You can find papers from the United States of people who put um, a in cleavage, the polybasic cleavage site in, in our virus. You can find uh, people who've reported it from Japan. And in October of 2019, um, out of Beijing, mm -hmm. they reported putting this into an adenovirus, I believe. No, I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm saying that it was done. I'm saying evolutionarily, it's not coming from a bat coronavirus. Uh, it, no, it does not look like it came from bats. They say um, in China that they found some smuggled, sick, um, dying pangolins who had had this site in them. Um, but 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 all these different sites uh, have interesting information. Now, um, so there's a furin site that's unusual and I would say people look at the 2.5 percent because most of the papers will talk about how how like a um, the virus this virus is to another virus and they'll talk about the 96 percent or whatever but people are rarely talking about that 2.5 percent and that's where I find all the interesting things are happening and so part of the 2.5% would be the furin cleavage point. Um, and isn't that interesting that it's, it's right next, now where they put it is right next to a uh, super antigen site. So um, there's that. Then, um, you know, there was an Indian paper that got retracted that said there was HIV, four sites of homology and um, they basically said, well, you know, there's 1.5 million different strains of HIV. Any cell, E. coli, any kind of eukaryotic cell can pick up these sequences. And we've seen how small little sequences, right? You know, they say, oh, it's just a small little sequence, not a big deal. But we saw the super antigen site, that's a, a big deal. We saw that that little bit of rubella homology, that's a, that's a big deal. So... Um, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Luc Montier, he put out a preprint and he, um, after one of the, uh, I think, uh, Chinese authors were talking about the rebuttaling how there could be four HIV sequences. And he says, well, in his preprint, he actually goes through and teaches you how you can do it yourself and look. In that 2.5%, there's 12 areas of HIV homology that are side by side. So if if the one paper said, well, four is just so extremely rare, but it you know it could happen, what are you going to say to um, uh, 12? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, yeah. I mean, yeah. Everybody has to make up their own mind. You know. It's, uh, <laughs> It's like wearing masks. You got to decide what yeah, it is. Yeah. The answer to the question is it's unlikely, it's natural, but we really cannot say anything like that and it's not proven. So we're just going to leave it at that uh, kind of that 2.5% area. There is one other question. I opened up the mic for you, Brenda. Feel free to ask the question this way. Um, then I think that will be the end of it. We already went about 10 minutes over. Okay, well, you noted about the, um, 
about the bats and the pangolins. And what I've seen in the news is uh, large numbers of minks on mink farms testing positive and having to be destroyed. And uh, I'm not sure if it's relevant to this or not, but is there a correlation between the SARS-CoV-2 in humans and the SARS-CoV-2 in these large numbers of minks? Yes, um, you, you, may, you may have heard me mention um, when they were doing vaccines, how they did them on ferrets because ferrets have uh, very similar ACE2 receptors. And so minks are, you know, related to ferrets. So very easily um, can minks get infected with this. We know cats can get infected. Um, very, you know, different animals can, and we study, we study those animals because they are like us. And so they do vaccine studies in ferrets, so we could do them in me. All right. Did I answer question? Um, well, I guess the thing was how many, how large the number of minks were compared to, uh, we've only seen very few cats and other species, but the minks, I think I was seeing numbers like hundreds of thousands. Right, right, because they're like ferrets and they have the ACE2 receptors, so they can, you know, if they, if they have a COVID positive handler and we know about the droplets, that, that it's easy for them to get it, right? All the droplets fall to the ground and that's where they are. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's very interesting. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for attending and I especially want to thank Dr. Cheryl Ortel because, you know, she spent three sessions really helping us navigate and deep dive into the paradoxical of findings in COVID and really help us understand. All the sessions that we have so far will be uh, posted on YouTube and you guys will get a copy of the PowerPoint once we sort that out. Um, so I want to thank um, everybody for attending and please spread the word about the sessions because we just want to get more people to know about this. Um, I want to thank Dr. Grossman, Dr. Ortel and Dr. Okasanya for doing this. Thank you guys and I hope Dr. Ortel will come back to the, our last session which will be on August 6th to conclude this since she helped start this whole process. Yeah, we can do. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all your great questions. I enjoyed it very much.